Hello, and welcome to Research Software Hour number, what are we on? 10, 10 or so? Number 10. Welcome, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> so today we've expanded to three people. So we've got An Fo here. I hope I said that right. Perfect. Okay, good. <laughs> um, yeah, so our general topic of today is how to make research more reproducible. And we talk, we'll talk not only about the basics, but what that even means. And we have this question as an icebreaker in the HackMD. What tool or trick can you recommend to make work or research more reproducible? It can be a small thing. This can also be a good input for what we will talk about. And maybe before we start, we can also ask um maybe you can say sentence or two like where you are working what you are working on maybe the background yes so i'm 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 working at the university of oslo in norway um and in the department of geosciences so i'm mostly involved with climate like climate community mm. and working on project to make more reproducible research with climate scientists See. Yeah. So is climate science, like, is the field generally not very reproducible? Uh, that's sort it's of a quite loaded opaque, question. It's opaque, yes. <laughs> but, <laughs> no, I think it's a very good question. Yeah. But, you know, that's sort of unfair because I guess many fields are not very reproducible. Like, which fields can yes. people claim is very reproducible right now? But this is a field where we should, we, where we <laughs> have to be reproducible because there are many climate deniers. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you want to avoid them to raise their voice, you mm -hmm. have to be reproducible. Right. But the answer is we are not <laughs> mm -hmm. yet, but we are trying. Yeah. Okay. We are not uh, any better than anyone else. And maybe some more context. So together with Anne and Richard and others, we so we are teaching together code refinery workshops. And we are also together working on Nordic research software engineer community and conference planning. Mm -hmm. So many things. And we thought it would be really fun to do this uh, show together. Yeah. Yeah. I guess sort of as part of this long-term plan of figuring out what kind of or how to take the show, where to take the show. So. Yeah, and the best is if we get really lots of questions and suggestions, and thanks a lot for the answers to our icebreaker question. Yeah. So how can, what are the little tricks to make things more reproducible? For instance, mm -hmm. thinking about our future self, uh, coding with more than one person, joint projects, especially if you work on several projects in parallel, because then you work on something, you pick it up again two weeks later, and maybe a little bit asynchronously. And I think if then, if you don't have good protocols for reproducibility, it can be really hard. Yeah. Um, some means to install software libraries, Conda environments. And I think today we might mm. talk about Conda stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so maybe we can say what reproducible what reproducibility means to each of us in our fields. So I'll begin. So this is not everything, but to me, the biggest problem I see, or the first problem we need to solve, is that when someone does some work, they submit a paper, it comes back in a few months with some requested changes, and then they sit down and try to make these changes, and they can't. And maybe they can't even make the original changes, like reproduce what they had before. So basically, what code did they run? In what order? Where were the libraries installed? Um, have the versions of libraries changed? All these kinds of things. But I guess it especially goes to the, like, what code did you run in what order? And to me, this is, like, this is not necessarily the most important thing. Normally, when you think reproducibility, you think, can someone else do it? But this is a very concrete problem. and what like if i can't convince people this is important there's hardly any chance of convincing anyone else something far more difficult is important 
I mean, same, I would say same experience here. What I would really like with reproducibility is that I'm think like that others can reproduce and that others can not only rerun it and get the same result and verify it, but that also that, that they can maybe take it and modify it for something else, so a, a reusability. But, but often also for me, it stops at re reproducing own work mm -hmm. and uh, like some old paper, old work from a few years ago is very difficult often. But even mm -hmm. picking up a project which was which I didn't touch for a few months already, that is always a bit of a startup time. Mm -hmm. Like what was again the compiler that I used? Uh -huh. What was the environment? Where are again the uh, the data files? Right. Uh, yeah. Then I need to go through emails and find out what did people again what were the issues. Mm -hmm. So often it stops already there. Yeah. I don't know how is it for how is it for Anne? Yeah, I mean this is very similar, and uh, I think to add to what you said is uh, the other motivation uh, in the climate community is for publication. Mm -hmm. Because uh, most of the time now we have more and more um, reviews saying it's not sufficient to put the code in GitHub. Mm -hmm. We have to do more. And so we are trying to find out what is more. And uh, the more is uh, for publisher, it has to be reproducible, which we need to find out what, what it means for our community and how to, uh, how to make uh, research reproducible, but without having too much work uh, on the scientist side. Mm -hmm. So that's mostly the motivation. Try to find uh, not only for a computing environment, but also on the publication uh, yeah. publication side. Yeah. So okay. So the publication side. So has anyone ever made their research so reproducible that it's like a push button kind of thing, where someone can download something and then run one command and then everything comes out the way this like the same way so uh, uh, someone's writing a similar question does reproducible also mean completely automated uh -huh, yes that's yeah. a good question mm -hmm. not necessarily i think yeah i mean i guess it can be reproducible but not automated but if it's automated then Hopefully, it's reproducible most of the time. Yeah. But not necessarily. I mean, not necessarily, <laughs> but like if it's the, easier, it's easier to uh, yeah. run it. Yeah, for me, the key is that the that the environment is documented, the dependencies are documented, yeah. and the steps are documented. Mm -hmm. And if it's automated, then sometimes the automation is the documentation of the steps. But maybe it's not everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think automation is maybe the ultimate step we would like to achieve. Yeah. I think we are far from it, mm -hmm. at least in yeah. what we do now. We are trying. Yeah. I mean, the closest I got to like push button reproducibility is for very small things using yes. notebooks and binder. And I think we will mm -hmm. show something later. Right, yeah. But I also discovered these tools really late. So I'm sure someone has come up with a list of these things, but what would you say are the different sort of layers of reproducibility? Like, for example, there's you have to reproduce the environment, and then you can reproduce the steps you run. Access to the um, data, I think. I guess, That's... yeah, getting access to the data. Yeah, access to the codes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, tools, access to the tools. <laughs> yeah, I guess if you make your code in MATLAB and then exactly. people that yes. don't have it can't. And I remember in most of the previous groups I worked with, even though the university had a license for MATLAB, the first thing that people would ask when they joined the group is, who has the bootleg copy of MATLAB? And to me, I thought, hmm, maybe this can be avoided by not using MATLAB. Yeah, but you have some legacy code sometimes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. MATLAB is free for university. Yeah. Which is a bad thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
But I guess yeah, maybe I, we can also oh, sorry. Yeah, at least for me, I well, I know some people still use MATLAB, but much more Python these days. Yeah, great mm -hmm. question on HackMD. As a reviewer, uh, so if you review a paper, a manuscript, uh, are you asking for the code? And do you review the code? Uh, so Anne was mentioning that um, in in her community, putting things on GitHub is not considered enough. I can mm -hmm. say that in my community, which is uh, computation chemistry, uh, uh, there are still papers being published where the code is not even shared. Mm -hmm. so I would say it's not even that far. And but I'm, I'm not sure asking. this is very different, actually, because in your community, this is not shared, but in my community, this is shared, but the publisher recognizes it, it's useless. So this mm. is why they are asking mm -hmm. for more, okay. because they have seen many times we are sharing yeah. something. Yeah. But if you have no way to really reuse what you have shared, it's not yeah. very different than in your community, which is not sharing. Yeah. Sorry for interrupting. Yeah. Oh. So what do they ask for, for sharing? Um, they asked for, for instance, they, uh, they mentioned recently, you need to have a DOI always. Mm, for the code? Yes. Okay. Uh, minimum. Mm -hmm. Because even having releases, it can be like manipulated after mm -hmm. yes. uh, you publish. Yeah. So that would be the minimum. And uh, as we mentioned earlier, some steps on how to use the code. So mm -hmm. the code needs to be documented a bit more than that. Uh, yeah. Putting like this on GitHub. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And should the steps include how to get the data, how to install? They the should code? mention the yeah, yeah. Uh, where the data mm -hmm. is located. Yeah. So I think the minimum is that the the code should cite the data, and also the paper should cite the code and the data, and they should cite each other so that they can find <laughs> one that you that you can yes. find the other mm -hmm. two if they are not in the same place. So you mean okay. having a DOI for each of them, one for yeah, the software, yes. one for the paper, and one for the data? Yes, mm -hmm. if they if they evolve at different speeds. Okay, mm -hmm. right. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. that's right. And how about this question? So do you, when you review a paper, do you ask for the code? And do you review the code? I ask mm -hmm. for the code, but I don't review the code. Because it's a lot of work to review. <laughs> I will yeah. be frankly honest, because they usually yeah. uh, in climate modeling, codes are very large. <laughs> yeah. Do so if you... this is something known, uh, I'm just, uh, OK. Yes, yeah. that's great. <laughs> Sorry. Do you look at, or do you try to run the code? No, mm -hmm. because it's uh, usually too large. So this is a bit yeah. of contradiction, because we, mm -hmm. we want to be reproducible, but knowing that nobody really is willing to reproduce mm. because you will not redo a simulation because it's too costly. Mm -hmm. But you want to know like the process because you yeah. may reuse a similar mm -hmm. process or workflow in a different context. Yeah. So the workflow, maybe the steps are more important. Yeah. That's usually what I'm looking at. I, I guess it's sort of like you, know, you want to do enough to convince the person they could do it without them having to actually do it. Like, you want to convince them that they could reproduce it well enough that they won't try to. Yeah, I'm not sure that, uh, I want Which to convince is... them they can reproduce it. I want to convince them they can reuse it. Mm. That is a good point. So I know there was this chart I saw once about reproducibility versus reusability versus generalizability oh, yes. but well i was just looking for it and have not been it's, it's a turing way no yeah, they have it way, there's nice nice chart yeah maybe somebody can find it and put it on the AKMD. because i can never remember ah, the terms but there here is we a go hierarchy to it. oh you found it already yeah <laughs> i will share the screen uh, and show it after I, there we go. Okay, so you can see it in the Twitch stream now. Um, table of definitions for reproducibility. 
So the two axes are can you change the data and can you change the code and rerun it? Which, well, I guess maybe the back, like, like concept of changing data and changing code is more mm -hmm. important than what these names are. So here in the graph, reproducibility is like the minimum, is it? Mm -hmm. I think so, yeah. Well, yeah. So, and I guess you need good code in order to run the analysis on different data. Like the data could be complete, or the analysis could be completely automated so that even the code is almost impossible to use. You can push the button and then get the same things out. But the code has to actually have good user interfaces in order to run mm -hmm. it on different data and like basically start over using it. Compared yeah, yeah. to not hard coded yeah. inputs, for instance. Yes, that's a good point. Yeah. And maybe I can mention that sometimes the data is like too big or too sensitive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But then it's really nice to to put in a small anonymized example that can right. be used to re rerun the mm -hmm. whatever it is. And I also wanted to mention, and I put it on the HackMD, ReproX. Uh, so yes, I put in the link to the Twitter good. and to the website. So these are really fun events uh, where the goal of the event is to meet together pick up a number of papers they can be own papers somebody else's papers mm -hmm. uh, computational papers and try to uh, trying to reproduce them and it's surprisingly uh, can be surprisingly difficult <laughs> and it's it's also surprisingly fun so it can be really fun and a lot yeah. of good learning to try to rerun somebody else's work but actually uh, you you learn for yourself on how yes. to do it yourself i yes. learned a lot um, of things like yeah. this so how do you recommend? Are there any repro hacks that we could try to do in an hour and an hour uh, or an hour and a half on stream? That would be nice. Because that would yeah, be, be fun. Yes. Yeah. Like these are the kind of things that might get a little bit boring to watch, but you sort of have to leave it on in the background, and then the discussion is more important than what the person's doing, since well. I guess, like usual, most of the time will be spent searching, doing web searches for random tools and error messages to solve them. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. There's a good question here. How do tasks to make work reproducible ch change given the scale of the project? Like the LHC analysis groups won't act like small teams of ecologists. I have the feeling they are better organized. The big groups are much better organized than the small group of ecologists. Yeah. I don't know if you are an ecologist, but I'm working with ecologists. And I can yeah. tell you, it's <laughs> not very well organized. Yeah. But I guess when you get to the size of LHC, then you actually, like they have people that are hired specifically to think about the reproducibility and to have good processes that you have to follow. I think here is they don't want to reproduce in that sense, but they have so strict um, procedure that if they would like to reproduce it, they could. Mm -hmm. But it, it's probably, I mean, so much costly, they will never yeah. try. But you know, you could also ask whenever you're doing some research, how often does your code run the first time? <laughs> Never. The answer is almost <laughs> never. So it's like you have to run your stuff yourself multiple times. So why not set it up where you can reproduce it? And also like the LHC, I mean, the data is so incredibly valuable because it cannot yes. be simply rerun and it cannot be generated by anybody else. Mm -hmm. and, and often we have to analyze it later by, uh, by tools that we cannot even imagine at this point. So, yeah. so I'm sure that they have teams. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, Thinking very carefully about that. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for the posting the the paper. Yeah. So I don't know in which order we will do it now because so Anne wanted to show us something about Jupyter books, but I don't know if Richard wanted to show something before. 
Now we can go to Jupiter Book. Sounds good to me. Um. Um, do you, you want me to share? You From want me where? To share your desktop in the, I think the desktop Jitsi. Okay, let uh, me check. I'm not sure I have it open now. Give me a few minutes. Oh yeah, I think. Um, so Jupiter book. Yes. So what is Jupiter book besides the obvious? So I know it's a way that you can use Jupyter notebooks to write things which get assembled into a book format. And I also happen to know that under the hood, it runs Sphinx now, Sphinx now the Sphinx documentation generator to basically turn. Screen? Yeah. Yes. Do you see the screen now with the Jupyter book or? Yeah, now I need to share it here. Yep. Uh, let's see. But this, can you zoom in some? This Jitsi quality is really bad. Uh, what do you want me to do? Like make your screen larger. Like the, the font, right? To yeah, the font. The font larger. Yeah. Is it, is, yeah. is it large enough? Actually, it looks so bad. Maybe we just need to share it via Zoom. OK. Ah, maybe it worked now. Let's, it looks, let's, it looks okay keep, to me. Yeah, let's keep, let's let's go for it. Yeah. Good enough. So, um, Jupiter book. So this is a Jupiter book. This mm -hmm. one. And so we were trying to find a tool where we could have a public publication like. Um, mm -hmm documents or like publication, but still uh, with some parts where embedded code, where you can execute the code right. while you are reading. Mm -hmm. So that was the main motivation because uh, initially we were using like binder, which is what I think Radovan will show later on. And uh, it was not really sufficient when you really want to write more uh, publication like documents. So we found this mm -hmm. tool, which is I think quite recent, mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's, it's very much a very simple uh, package. You have to use pip install. I think you don't know if this is an overview here. Um, you have to make a, a configuration YAML file to give like the title of your book. Mm -hmm. So you, when you start to create your book, it will generate a set of files. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you need to edit this file for configuring your, what they call a book, which is like a, a set of Jupyter notebook markdown files, mm -hmm. which you will be able to execute on the fly. Uh, and you, what was very useful for us is like having a table of contents. Mm -hmm. Because this is usually what uh, we are lacking when we do a binder. Right, yeah. I guess in binder, the table do, contents yeah. is just the list of files. But... Yes. So you can do some tricks to have like a proper or a nicer table of content, mm -hmm. but it's a bit more um, like difficult. Well, this one is really a, a small file, a talk.yml mm -hmm. underscore talk.yml, where you will list all the different file with the order you want to have in your book. Right. And yeah. it will generate automatically your, uh, your book. Mm -hmm. And you can publish um, on GitHub, for instance, and you can automate the generation of your, what they call book. So this was uh, so far the answer we have for making um, yeah. automated. And uh, you can have like uh, figures like here you have image or you have, I think, plots. And what is nice is you can, I think, uh, no, maybe not this one. If we take an example, you can execute. Uh, mm -hmm. So let me show you an example where you can execute. Uh, 
um, the book, they have a small example. Is it this one, like this one? I don't know what uh, what you see so far. Hmm. Do you see these uh, code blocks here? Mm, it's still loading. Okay. Okay, Jupyter Notebook files with code blocks. Yes. So mm -hmm. here you have like the normal uh, Jupyter Notebook code blocks, but what is nice is you have here, you can start to execute your code. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we really like is this uh, launch CD. So if you click on this, it will take a bit of time. So uh -huh. each cell will, uh, so you are still mm -hmm. like in the read mode. Yeah. You don't go mm -hmm. to the binder, but this is by binder design. And you can mm -hmm. really execute cell by cell. Okay. So now it's loading on binder the single page or the whole? Yeah, so one page is one uh, notebook. Mm -hmm. And it oh. will be on one. Uh, my binder. Ah, uh, and it's still in the same page. So there's run yes. and restart. Yeah. Mm. And you can uh, update the code. So here you can really uh, add yeah. some print and still execute the code. Yeah. So, it's which means, like for instance, a, sorry, yeah. So it's a bit like Sphinx, but executable. Yeah. And, yes. And in the, the individual pages are running on binder. Yes. So, I mean, it's exactly like uh, Sphinx, except you have, uh, in addition, some codes yeah. where you can execute with, uh, with Binder, but yeah. still uh, keeping the layout of, uh, of like a normal um, mm -hmm. publication, mm -hmm. which is nice, for instance, when you have a, a publication where you, like in climate, we often focus on, on one area, but mm -hmm. the data can be global. But sometimes when you would like to make a plot with, with a different area, so you can, yeah. if you have the code, it's just changing the, like the latitude and longitude. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And with the same data, you can uh, visualize an, another area of interest. Yeah. For you. So this is what, uh, what we like the most with yeah. this. And it's, uh, it's quite simple in the sense you mostly need to, uh, to create your Jupyter notebook and to push it on a GitHub repository. Mm -hmm. And it will generate this page and the table of content automatically yeah. and this button. Mm -hmm. And you can also link it to your own um, like Jupyter Hub instance if you want, mm -hmm. which is and what we do for courses. Okay. Are you planning to are you planning to then submit it to a journal or so how will it then interact with like the traditional journal format? Yeah, so that's uh, uh, the thing. So far, uh, publisher they want uh, us to do like more uh, advanced uh, publication, but at the same time there is no really journal accepting interactive publication. Mm -hmm. So you still have to create a, a PDF. So for instance, here you see at the end, uh, usually you create a PDF. Yeah. And the PDF, I think is still like a bit experimental. So in terms of quality, mm -hmm. you still have the problem where you want to go to a um, pub public publisher, you will, it's, it's still not good enough. Mm -hmm. So that's the main issue we have. So I don't know if you have any tips. Yeah, I don't know about journals that do stuff like this. I'm a bit behind in the publishing of stuff. But, yeah. Does anyone else look at this and think this would be really useful for code refinery? Imagine a notebook with a bash kernel, and then you could go and interactively do the exercises from within the same page here. Yeah, you can do that, actually. I mean, we use it for running small climate model, like yeah. a single column, where you can uh, open a bash and make your bash command. Mm -hmm. We could do that in code refinery, actually. And what is nice is you have like the references. So in like in real paper, mm -hmm. you can add your reference and you can reference your uh, article in uh, in your document, Markdown or Jupyter. Yeah. And they really appear like a normal. 
newspaper. Mm -hmm. Oh, so the bibliographies and stuff. Yes, so all the bibliography and all the like the mathematical equation, which we use oh. very often, mm -hmm. which is the normal uh, strength system. Right. Yeah, and I think this well. can be really wonderful for uh, teaching material, in both mm -hmm. for yes. teaching tools, but also to teach actually the, the scientific domain. Yes, mm -hmm. so we use it for teaching. Uh, we use it a lot, and uh, especially we use it for we are asking students for uh, to, to add their own notebook mm -hmm. um, so they can uh, we can see what they do uh, interactively and we can execute so we link it to i don't know if i can show you what we did last year for instance uh, i think that's this one um, so we ask a student to push so here this is some example maybe um, so we are we link it to our own Jupyter Hub, mm -hmm. and when they push their own notebook, we can click on the button, and it will direct us to um, the Jupyter Hub instance where we have all the data available, mm -hmm. and then we can execute what they have written. So it yeah. means this, this this is linked to the data, and we can correct it. Yeah. So which is quite uh, nice also for teaching them. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and that's uh, that's it on my side. Yeah, but I really like so, it. Mm -hmm. So, how many of the people that you work with are using this now? Is it most people? This is mostly master students and uh, PhDs. But they so they use it uh, now. We use it as a. Um, for sharing uh, the list of experiments we are running, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, as a as a way to I think it's here. If I look. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. It's yeah. Uh, no ESM X. Yeah, this is a notebook. Uh, okay. There's a good so question. They, yeah, sorry. This is where here where they we can we can share all the different experiments mm -hmm. done, uh, so you can really um, see the latest uh, um, development from yeah. the model. Okay, right. I didn't see the question. Yeah, there is a question in HackMD. To make our research reproducible, do we have to be using notebooks? And not necessarily. I, I sort of <laughs> agree with what it says there. Like, you know, you don't need to use notebooks. I guess the reason notebooks are nice is that it records the exact sequence of steps you run in a way that you can see them in the output. But you can do the same with scripts as long as you remember what you run in what order. I think given. notebooks are very nice for showing visualization yes. and mm -hmm. like plots and uh, like publication like documents. Yeah, right. It's, it's nice for linear things like reading data, yeah. filtering, mm -hmm. compute statistics, create a plot. Yeah. But uh, otherwise, uh, the alternative are workflows, mm -hmm. scripts, uh, documenting dependencies. Yeah. So, um, I guess what I can show is, well, it's actually something I learned from Radovan. It's this alias to make a new Python virtual environment with basically no work. And I think it's worth showing it again because it's something I've begun using all the time. But Radovan, while we're on Jupyter book stuff, do you want to talk about um, Binder Hub and that? Or should we go on? I can. I don't know what is the best order. I also had one more question for Anne, if we have the time. Yeah. And that question was, so what, what is the source code behind the Jupyter book? And maybe I missed that. Is that, is that RST, restructured text? So if I want uh, to put it, what is it? To be frankly so, honest, I don't know the latest yeah. version. Okay. Yeah. So I, 
I was looking at this and I think it's using Sphinx with this myst markdown parser. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Which is, well, the thing that I've been advocating to others that they should use. Yeah. And thanks for the tip so, because I've started using it and I like it a lot. And yeah. because the reason why I asked this question is because this I think this can make collaboration really nice and mm -hmm. yes. simple because then we can collaborate, pull request, uh, git diff, all that is really easy. Yes, right. and this is nice to diff like uh, uh, the Jupyter. You can yeah. really click on the on the binder and you can really see the differences, which is mm -hmm. nice for, for instance, when you need to check students. Notebook. Yeah. Um, right. Oh, I'm that's not sure a good how to point. stop sharing. Yeah, I mean that's uh, initially that was a motivation for us mm -hmm. when we teach. Uh, we are teaching like a e science course. Right. There are many students, like 25 students, doing all different things mm -hmm. using different data, and at some point we need to check. So we need to run it, but we also need to help students to make yeah. the right better yeah. visualization and things like that. Mm -hmm. So we need to be able to execute and diff and show the diffs mm -hmm. to the students. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also good comment on Twitch. Yeah, it's a bit like our markdown, I think, similar idea. Yes, yeah. that was the closest. I mean, that was oh, the yeah. objective to mm -hmm. make it closer to the R markdown, which yeah. is excellent. For... Yeah, which I like a lot. I'm also learning it. Yeah, now. exactly. In particular, I think the thing I like the most, and which I now start missing in, let's say, the traditional Jupyter, is that I can actually write it in my editor directly. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes I want to do that. Yeah. I don't have to write it through the notebook. Yeah. So. I don't know what is the best order of things you decide, but I can, yeah. I can show a few things. I can also do it later. I'd say let's have you show the things because what i was going to show we've already actually seen once before yeah but it would be good to show it again i think it's a really useful alias that i use twice every day <laughs> mm -hmm. so i think we will have time i i don't i will not need i will not use many minutes so let's yeah. show also later the the ve alias but if you like you can give me the screen yeah uh can you share the jitsi I think I, mean, I am. Mm -hmm. Am I? Oh, uh, I see Anne's desktop in the desktop Jitsi. Oh, do I need to do something? Okay, all right. Am I in the right thing? Sorry, I stopped sharing. Okay. Should I stop and restart? Yeah, I see your share now. Right. You okay? You've got the screen share. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what did I want to show? Um, I wanted to show you actually. Uh, first, I wanted to start with a Jupyter notebook, mm -hmm. and something I have used uh, yesterday. I was teaching um, data visualization. Mm -hmm. I was demonstrating. Jupyter and Binder. Mm -hmm. And I, I just want to show that because also connecting here to reproducibility. I will zoom in a little bit. But so what I have here is a little example GitHub repository where I have the notebook. I have the data in it, so comma separated value data. I have some instructions, I have the license. And most importantly here I have the requirements of text. Mm -hmm. And this is a Python project. Instead of requirements.txt, I could also use environment.yaml. Would be also fine here. And here I'm documenting the two libraries that I'm depending on. Yeah. And I document, so this is a plotting library that I like a lot, and pandas. And I also, I here I spinned the versions. So right. that if mm -hmm. I rerun it in two years later, and both of these libraries have evolved and maybe changed, it will still use these versions and hopefully it will still work. Mm -hmm. and, and then I think a couple of shows ago, we talked about the binder, but I think we, we it's a, such a wonderful service and we didn't, we cannot show it enough. So I just want to show it once again. I had 
So all I needed to do is I put in the notebook and I put in this require as a text. And then through my binder org, I created this badge where I can just launch the notebook. And anybody can do it. I mean, the, the watchers can do it. You don't need mm -hmm. the software installed. You can, I guess you can do it on your phone even. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> yeah. So here it's running. Um, and I can run this. Okay, great. Okay. Uh, all right. I, maybe I was idling too long. So I will just <laughs> I will restart it. it and yeah. Let's start it. It it can take a few minutes, especially the first time first time this is being initialized. Here I'm hoping to will start up quick because it is hopefully cached. Yeah, it should be in the cache, yes. And what we can do, like in a cooking show, I will just let this cook in the oven and I will switch <laughs> to the other to the other meal mm -hmm. that I wanted to show you because I also wanted to show you that you can run R Studio uh, in on Binder. And in the meantime, the other one finished. So before I switch context, here is it again, the Jupiter. And here is my yeah. notebook. <laughs> and what I will do is I will run all the cells so, so that I can show you what I was teaching yesterday mm -hmm. to do data visualization. So what I'm putting here are, and here I have the full, full uh, pipeline. At the end, I have a plot. So what, what is it here? GDP per capita. So on the x-axis, mm. the more wealthy the people are. Mm. On the y-axis, the longer they live. And the points are grouped by continents. Right, yeah. And we, we can see this trend. Anyway, so anybody can run this mm -hmm. even later. And you can even go in and you can modify the code. Mm. And let's run this after the modification. So and you have this button GitHub. Do you? Does it mean you can also see and change push to GitHub? What does it do? I don't oh, know. I, I didn't yeah. use that button. <laughs> okay, I will click it did, and let's see what happens. Did you do anything to put that button there? No, I didn't. Wow, that's uh, nice. So this takes me actually not only to the repository, but it takes me to the precise version. It's oh yeah, here, but, uh, that's really nice. To, to that hash. Mm -hmm. uh, nice. Okay, so it's a link to. GitHub. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so but that's take home nice. message here. This is really important to document. And then binder binder is all ready to go. I also wanted to show you this R Studio. And and I actually have two ways. If we have time, I will show the two ways. But this is maybe the the more traditional way of, of doing mm. it. Oh yes, this one I know, yes. So what I did, runtime to text, I specify what is the version of R mm -hmm. by version and date. And this will, as far as I understand, because I'm new to R, it will also pin the versions of the, the of the libraries. As far as I understand, okay. it will use the libraries corresponding to this date. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah yes. And, and this is what is a bit tricky, this is for my phone. Exactly. And in some repro hack, we tried to rerun an R code and we didn't mm. we didn't really have this insight. So what we did there is we we took the date of the pub of the paper mm -hmm. and we mm -hmm. have imagined that probably i don't know two months earlier so we took a little bit older r version and yeah. then it then it started working so this okay. is one thing then in install r here i describe what are the dependencies so in this case i depend on two libraries it's a bit different than in requirements.txt so mm -hmm. here i don't pick the versions but it will pick up the versions by the date okay oh Gets the versions by the date in the R installation. In the runtime. Yeah, huh. that's how I understand it. Okay. Uh, okay. And then, I, then I have this yeah. R markdown, uh, and again I have this binder, and I can run the. Mm -hmm. So this is R Studio now running on, on binder. So I can do all the R Studio things, and here I can run the R markdown file. And let's run run it all run all. And, and what is going on? And it's the same example, but now in done in R. Yeah. ggplot2. And this is R Studio server yeah. in Binder. Yes. Yeah. Configured so Binder with runtime. 
Yes, Bundle can do several things. It can run Jupyter, it can run Arab Studio, it can run Shiny, it can run Stencilo, something else. Voila, uh, voila dashboard, I think you can. Yes, mm -hmm. and, and actually you can run anything you want because it can also run Docker containers. Yes. Yeah. All right. Okay, and since, yeah, I don't know if we have some more time, I can show the other way. Yes, I'd like to see because I don't know the other way. The other way is, what is the other way, is because just as a little detour, I started learning R recently, coming from Python, and the first thing I did is I opened a search engine, I was searching, how do you do virtual environments <laughs> in, R. in R? Because yeah. I didn't want to install system-wide, I wanted to, so I, yeah, stuck mm -hmm. the And then there is an answer, Backrat, and... Okay. And unfortunately, so I read this, but I stopped reading somewhere. And I tried all these things out. So I learned a little bit of Backrat, but I didn't read this part here. Uh, update. Backrat <laughs> has been self deprecated. <laughs> <laughs> so then, after two weeks of learning and discovering things, I learned that Backrat is on the way out, but RNF is on the way in. Mm -hmm. And RNF is apparently the way to do it now because you can create lock files where you can lock the versions of your dependencies. Okay. Uh, what I what I didn't find is I didn't find any RNF examples for binders, so I created my own. And I don't know whether this mm -hmm. is this is really the way to go, but the the difference here, I still have the runtime, the text. Right. So I still have the the R version. Mm -hmm. But this time I don't have this installed as R, but I have a lock file. Let's see how that lock file looks. It's a JSON, which lists all the dependencies with not only version, but also checksum. Yeah. But then I need to initialize the lock file once I once you start the the binder. OK, so yeah. I, I do it with post build. So here you go oh. directly to the R repository, I mean, the C client. Yes. So. Ah, yes, I think okay. that's better. So and post. with post build, I run, I initialize the RN and mm. I restore it from the lock. And what was the motivation for me is because I wanted to have a way not only to run reproducibly on on binder, mm. but I also, also wanted to have a way so that I can run the same environment on my machine. Mm. And that was for me somehow difficult in the other in the other approach. So now I can, I mean, this this one, the RN restore, I can also run on my computer. And then I get the same environment also on my laptop. Yeah. Oh yeah, nice. And it's the same example. It's Gapminder again, the same thing. Yeah. I, yeah. Anyway, I think I don't want to go more into detour here. Okay. Yeah. So uh, learning R is fun. Uh, I'm still new. If there are better ways, I would be happy to hear. I really like R Markdown for the reasons that we discussed. Yeah. Do you want to show Richard the VE? Yeah, OK. So who remembers the chaos monkey example? I'm pretty sure I've said it here before, but it's still I'm one sure of my favorite things, too. I think, things we, too. I think we wanted to say it, but I'm not sure we discussed it. Yeah. So is the one from Netflix, or? Yes. Yeah. So let me, OK, stream should see the right thing. Yeah, so basically, Netflix in their systems operations group, they said, OK, so we need to plan for servers going down because we have these thousands of things running. Any one of them could die at any time. But it's really hard to plan for something that's rare. So they made something called the Chaos Monkey, which would go and randomly turn off servers at well, any time. So basically, it forced their engineers to plan on stuff being shut off at any time. So it made the handling the failures a routine thing, which means that they could do it easily. So sort of the whole way, like this whole idea of reproducible research, I guess it's all a trade-off between doing things manually and making things automatic. So the more you make automatic, then the more that, well, there's a chance that can be reproduced. Uh, 
there might be a different operating system or different other stuff that changes. But this is one thing that I have to do often, so I've made it automatic, thanks to Radovan's idea. So let's take a project I have. Uh, okay, this is something I know should work right now. Sphinx lesson. Um, if I list this directory, I see there's a virtual environment. So at any time I say, okay, I might have done something, I'm not sure what it is. So I will remove the virtual environment from here. And it takes a short time. And then there's requirements.txt. So I run this alias VE and it will look and see, is there a virtual environment? If so, activate it. If not, create one, install requirements.txt, and then drop me into it. So now, basically for all of my projects that I've started this, I can be sure that my requirements are pretty reproducible because I delete the environments and recreate them. Well, much more often than I used to now. Also, when I'm going back to an old project, I cd to the directory and then I do ve and that restarts the existing environment. So here I am. Uh, if I do pip list, there's a ton of stuff and this came from the requirements file. So yeah, I can deactivate it. I can reactivate it. I can deactivate it and remove it and then make it again just for fun. Yeah, I use this a lot. So, yeah. Really convenient. Do you have an alias like this, but for Conda? I don't. Yeah. But it's also because I don't use Conda often enough. Yeah. So to have an uh, to have an alias which will, I think we should create it. That will, uh, mm -hmm. if there is an environment at YAML, it will use it and it mm -hmm. will set up set you up an isolated environment yeah. and yeah. install into it. Yeah. And if one, yeah, and if it if already there is an environment, it it should only activate it. Mm -hmm. And do you think it should look? Should it install the environment into the working directory or into the home directory? like Conda does if you give it just a name. Yeah, I think into the current one. Yeah. So that if so that you don't leave any other environments. Uh, personally, I would prefer it to have it in the in my current project. So that if I delete the project, everything's gone. Yeah. Yeah, that would be better. I assume. Yeah. Can you do that with Conda? I, I don't do that. I mean, I never looked at it. I always uh, create environment in the default mm -hmm. Conda pass. But I guess you can create it. Yeah. There is a prefix I option that, or there's a path option that tells you the path to create it that mm -hmm. we used to recommend people to use. But I guess it requires some investigation. Yeah, but it's a good point to create it in the in the current, I mean, in the in the directory. Yeah. Right? yeah. That's good. I will try. Yeah. There's a comment in the chat, Conda is too slow for this, which yeah <laughs> it's it's it supposed to become faster with a newer version mm -hmm. um, yeah and actually there are some uh, packages which are, are alternatives to conda yeah which i don't remember the name I could it be uh, could it be miniconda or no it be it's uh it's uh it's sort of developed i think by Cronstadt. Mm. if i find it yeah. and it's supposed to be faster um, yeah. I, can't, well, I will not find it because I'm looking for it. Yeah. And then, you know, oh, yeah. So we had this idea to next week have a chat or have a week dedicated to talking about conda and basically make it like a conda tutorial and 
will live together go over all the different aspects which someone needs. And then anytime in the future when someone needs Conda, we can direct them to this video. Do you have any do you have any suggestions for what we should cover? Those watching. So Mamba is an alternative to Conda. Ah. M-A-M-B-A. -M it is supposed to be super fast. Mm -hmm. So is it like a re-implementation of Conda that's compatible or a replacement that's incompatible? Um, I think they're re-implementation of the Conda package manager in C++. This okay. is what they say on the, mm. on the... And this is because uh, it was Conda is known to be slow, but I, I think the latest version of Conda they have improved. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Is Mamba in Conda? Uh. <laughs> Don't know. It <laughs> 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 would be. Actually, it is. Yes, it is. Yeah. <laughs> so you can Conda okay. install Mamba and you can Mamba install. Yes, <laughs> Conda. <laughs> hmm. Okay. So maybe we can so, add this one next week. Yeah. Is Mamba ready that we can re recommend people use Mamba instead of Conda? Does it use the same repositories as Conda? I have no idea. I, I just heard about it very recently okay. well i never try but we i could try yeah i guess that's something to search for next week yes I mean, at least the example shows that you can install from conda forge yeah yeah, yeah you you can uh, but i'm not sure how uh if if this is the only repository mm -hmm. uh, your your mm -hmm. packages i don't know yeah Yeah, I mean, we have so many problems here where we make these complex conda environments that can't be upgraded or there gets to be some major dependency problems and, well, yeah. But okay, so today we talked about reproducibility. Most of it was talked, well, two of the examples were sort of environment or application level of reproducibility. So the binder and Jupyter book things. As Jupyter book will reproduce, does it reproduce the environment or the code or both? I guess sort of both if it runs on yes. binder. You, you have the same, it's like for a binder repository, you have a, a requirement yeah. files or environment mm -hmm. of is a list of packages you need for your codes. Yeah. So it's like an additional uh, mm -hmm. layer, if you want. Yeah. And then um, we, well, the virtual environment thing was a environment level of reproducibility. What would you all think about reproducing the code with virtual environment versus Docker containers? You mean like at next show? To... Yeah, like which is, like personally, I like the idea of using virtual environments better because, well, Docker, if you're lucky, you can rebuild it and then it's rebuilding the entire operating system. And that's sort of, useful but not necessary. And if you can't rebuild it, then you can't change it and it's not very useful long term. Mm -hmm. Well virtual environment since like you expect people to build it again themselves, that makes it a little more mm -hmm. likely that they actually can. And the only problem is uh, if you don't have to do it in a Docker. Is sometimes you use packages you have on your own machine, mm -hmm. which is what happened to me recently. Mm. Like when it needs a C library or something, which is yeah. I thought I was like in a in a very fresh uh, virtual machine, 
-hmm. on the cloud, but in fact, it was not fully clean. Yeah. And they were like uh, one package already available. Yeah. And then I thought I didn't need it. And then I, when I tried to push it where the, we use Docker, yeah. it failed. Mm -hmm. There's someone that wrote in the HackMD, containers allow for scaling that virtual environments do not. What do you all think about that? I mean, containers can be moved around and duplicated, but if you have, yes. if you can make a new virtual environment, you can reinstall that too. It just, it's a little bit more manual to do it. I guess it is a nice abstraction to have the whole operating system there. So it's not like go to a new machine, clone a Git repository, set up the environment and yeah. then run your code, but just pull this and run a single command. And maybe it was already mentioned, but um, what already happened to me with uh, with virtual environments or Conda is that I thought I had everything documented and it was reproducible, mm -hmm. but I was just lucky because, mm -hmm. because it picked up something from my computer. Yes. Right. Yeah. Um, so and if you are if you are more isolated, like in a in a container, you you are really more isolated, so you really see all the dependencies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you I mean, can use Conda in your Docker. Yeah. Yes, yes, you can. But maybe, maybe a good approach would be to go to the container, check that it's really yes. isolated, and then go back to. Yes. Yeah. Actually, that's what is recommended, and this is what I failed to do recently. <laughs> this is why I messed up, yeah. <laughs> and I lost. I don't know, like two days. Yeah. And good suggestion right. on the chat for the Conda session is uh, how to get Conda on a new machine purely via terminal and install it. Mm. I, I was already in the situation, so I wanted to, mm -hmm. I needed to have it, but it wasn't available on the system. It was a cluster, mm -hmm. was, yeah. but, but you can still install it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. But it would be good to show. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Super. Yeah, well, close. it's been an hour, so thanks for listening. Hopefully this wasn't too rambling and boring for our listeners. At least I learned the new things. I really like this Phoebe thing and Jupiter book. I think we need to check that out. Um, and super so, cool that Anne, Anne was joining. And yeah. I hope we keep it up. Yeah. Yes, Let's, Thursday yeah, is good. Keep it up. <laughs> yes. yeah, that's why we also changed to Thursday so that I think it's simply more fun if we do it three together. Yeah. And thanks so much for watching. Okay. Thanks a lot. I'll stop the recording.